lot for the chance to give this course. Um, so I spent quite a lot of time thinking about the title of the course, so I should write it on the board. this course to be is a, a kind of a guidebook to perverse shoes. So in the same way that you might um, open up you know, a guidebook of some kind of verbs or something like this and you look at it and there's lots of pictures and you can quickly orient yourself and maybe um, I won't give so many proofs. I want, to, I want you to have some kind of pictures in your mind when you think about perverse shoes. That's the, that's the goal. Um, and the motivation for this goal is that perverse sheaths are extremely important in representation theory, but if you read the definition, it's a very kind of black box thing. You have this derived category that you don't really understand, and then there's this mysterious black box inside this derived category that you're told satisfies all these wonderful formal properties. However, uh, there's no kind of geometric intuition in this definition, I don't think. Or you have to work very hard to see the geometric intuition. However, but if you read the original papers of, um, of uh, Goretzky and McPherson, it's incredibly geometrically rich. You know, there's lots of pictures and you can tell that they live in this world of rich ge geometric intuition. And somehow this has been lost to representation theorists and I think it's been lost to many of us. And so I'm trying to kind of recapture this rich geometric world as, a, as an outsider. Um, so that's one thing that I would like to um, emphasize is that um, the, the course is by an innocent bystander. <coughs> so this is the kind of, this should allow me to make mistakes and say stupid things. And things. I'm a kind of outsider looking in trying to understand what's going on. So the people that are not innocent bystanders are people like McPherson and Di Catalan Migliorini and um, and Bilonen and Braden. Um, okay, so that's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing that I wanted to say is that if you want to stay motivated for this course, um, there's two wonderful articles you can read. The first one is called by Kleinman. Or Kleinman. Is it there again? I can't remember. By Kleinman, yeah. It's okay. It's, the, um, it's called The Development of Intersection Homology Theory. So this gives a lovely picture of, uh, it's just a fascinating story how this theory, theory developed. Um, and the other, it's a long paper which is very beautiful, uh, it's by Vika Tavim And the last thing that I wanted to say before kind of starting the course is that uh, 
I've given you a, a lot of exercises, but of course I don't expect you to do all these exercises. Um, there's too many to do in two weeks, unless you, you know, unless you're already familiar with this area. <coughs> which is kind of, that would be pointless for you to come to this course. This uh, and I just think I would like, um, you know, even if you don't do all the exercises, please, please read them all at least, and just have them in your head and have them active in some sense. Okay, so the first lecture today. Um, so, what I want to explain in these lectures, in these lectures, is that the kind of algebraic properties of perverse sheaves um, reflect, in a very subtle and accurate way, the topology of algebraic varieties and maps between them. And in order to make any sense of this statement, you need to have a rough idea of what algebraic varieties look like, and you have, need to have a rough idea of what maps between algebraic varieties look like. So the, this first lecture will only be examples of algebraic varieties and maps between them. And also, if in this entire course, all you think about is curves and surfaces, there is enough material here to, to satisfy you. So you don't need to you don't need to think beyond that if you if you don't want to. You don't need to be, think beyond curves and surfaces. And even curves is very interesting. And just for one last bit of motivation, I want to give you a quote from Money, which I can't remember, so I'm paraphrasing. <coughs> so the quote examples of out of frame right. So the basic problem is that we can't really draw pictures, and this is love. This is really lovely encapsulated by this quote of money. It said something like, um, "If we could see higher dimensional varieties, <coughs> they would be in every art gallery or something like." I think, and so this is um, paraphrasing um, basically uh, the point of this quote, so this quote I found in this, this book of running called Mathematics as Metaphor. I think the point of this quote is that higher dimensional algebraic varieties are these incredibly beautiful things, but the problem is that we can't really see them. And so we kind of we spend our lives trying to approximate what they look like. Okay, so so um, just to get started, we will we will so um, we will draw both real and complex features. <coughs> And the problem is that we can only really draw complex pictures of curves. And just to illustrate what's going on, I want to consider y squared equals x. Um, x minus one. Well, let's take the, the projected version. Picture. 
Um, a equals B is not equal to C. Note that in this example, um, each picture is a degeneration of the one above it, and we can imagine what happens topologically here. So here we have one of these cycles contracting, and then here we have the other cycle contracting. Um, and what we would like to do, so basically throughout, when we're talking about commercial sheaves, we'll be talking about sheaves on the complex points of some algebraic variety. And we'll very often encounter singular varieties. And I want to, um, I want to just briefly review stratification theory. So if we have, if M is a connected manifold, Then the um, the self homeomorphisms of M act transitively on M. And this is a this is a lovely way of saying that M is kind of the same everywhere. But if we look at a self homeomorphism, for example, of this elliptic curve, it clearly has to pick the singular point. And this is the statement that this space is not the same everywhere. But when we stratify a variety, we would like to break it up into pieces where each piece is kind of the same, same everywhere along that piece. That's what stratifying means. So in order to do that more um, kind of, so we both do this stratification. So gratification of a variety <coughs> x to the decomposition and go cut from the decomposition um, so a disjoint union with sets such that a each x lambda is connected, constructible, and smooth. And secondly, uh, the closure is a union strap. So The x lambda are called strata, and each x lambda is a union of strata. Constructible. What does it mean, constructible? Constructible in the sense of um, algebraic geometry. Uh, so I guess uh, I mean so let's say locally closed in the Zeritsky point. So open in its closure.
Um, and given x, a, 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 a possibly singular variety, So equisingular uh, should mean that the self-homeomorphisms of X act transitively on every strata. But you can, we can say equisingular singularity more precisely. So, um, i.e., for each. So this, this is kind of, what I'm about to say is kind of informal, but one should this is, should be the picture that one has in your mind when you think about the equisingularity of the strata. So for each x in x lambda, there exists an open neighborhood u of x and a pointed space Space V from X lambda intersecting U times V. U, which is which is the identity of which is kind of the identity on um, So, so here we have x lambda, and this is potentially globally very complicated, but locally it looks like a manifold. And so now we can look at a neighborhood inside our, inside our bigger space, and basically it should have a kind of product structure along along x lambda locally. So that's when can we expect it to be real analytic? Sorry? Can we expect it to be real analytic? This isomorphism? Mm -hmm. I guess so, yeah. Um, ah, no, no, no. Um, yeah, I think that one should really stay in the topological category. Okay. Um, some kind of picture. So here our stratum would be x lambda, and then this is just a product with some possibly singular space. And in order to make this discussion more precise, one should use this topological theory of stratified spaces, which I won't go into, but this is the picture that one should have in mind. And naively, one might just say, OK, let's just take x, take a singular locus, take the singular locus of the singular locus, take the singular locus of the singular locus, etc. And do we get a stratification in this sense? And the answer is no. So um, the, that existence of such a stratification is tricky, is demonstrated
by this famous example called Whitney's umbrella. <coughs> So this is the singular surface given by x squared equals y squared <coughs> y squared z. And so one of the exercises is to convince yourself, so this is w, one of the exercises is to convince yourself that it looks like, looks like the following. like an extremely useless umbrella. Um, and here, the, um, this axis, so this is, um, so z, this is the singular locus. second exercise on the exercise sheet, but if you look away from this point here, away from the point zero, 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 then um, a neighborhood of the singularity looks like two copies of C2 identified along the line. And in particular, if you delete the singular locus, the thing becomes dis disconnected, as should be clear from this real picture. However, the, the same behavior does not occur at this point here. And so in this example, this is not this is not equisingular along the singular locus. I mean, yeah, so in this case the singular locus is just is smooth and it's not equisingular along. any self-homeomorphism of, of the Whitney umbrella, of the complex points of the Whitney umbrella, have to fix this point. And so, in this case, we see that, a prop, that the, 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 the God-given stratification of this would be the regular locus, Z without the zero point and the zero point. But is the theory that the, the God-given certification can be refined so that it is a certificate? Yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. And also, is there a minimal such certification? Uh, I think so, yeah. I think if you just take the you literally take the orbits under the self and uh -huh. <laughs> But, as you say, as I said, I'm an innocent bystander. Um, so, and Whitney, so we, we've kind of gone from, uh, the, the first statement was just this, this abstract notion of under the self homeomorphisms, and now we have this kind of local normal triviality and then Whitney discovered a geometric condition that guarantees this. And this allows one to prove the existence of such stratification. So Whitney. <coughs> on this 
specification. <coughs> and the condition is somewhat is somewhat technical. Um, but I'll give it so that we've seen it once in our lives. Um, so if x mu is in the pain in x lambda r and we have points, so we have an infinite sequence of points a i in x lambda and b i in x mu converging, both converging to, uh, let's say, B in X mu. Then the limit of the secant lines Connecting AI and BI um, is contained in the limit of the tangent space. Can you see when I write at the bottom here? No. So maybe you can see to about here. Um, this contains the limit of the tangent plane, tangent other plane. The AI give both limits. So, in this picture, I will explain why this condition fails. Yeah, but what's the tangent height of the Or just tangent, tangent height. So, um, in this example here, we have to think of x as embedded in some Euclidean space. Okay? Yeah. So here are my. And it's a real condition, right? Yeah. This can this this can all be framed phrased in terms of real analytic <coughs> So here are my bi points, and here are my ai points. So we saw that this is the this is the kind of problem point. This is the problem limit point in terms of the local normal triviality. And if you look at the limit of the secant lines, you get a line that's sub going like this, whereas the limit of the tangent planes is just constant. And so this condition, this condition fails. Could you explain what the secant line? The secant line is just the line joining AI to BI. Ah. Let's see how these. But anyway, this is probably too. Um, so it's an exercise to think about this more carefully in this example. And then one has the theorem that, um, so a, stratif a stratification
And then theorem, this is due to Whitney, any um, right. And uh, there's a more refined version of this theorem, which is if you just start with any stratification, you can always refine it to a witness application. So later on, we'll be considering constructible sheaves, and so they will come with a, with a stratification, and then you would like to be able to refine that further, and this you can always do. So moreover. It is gratification. So in some sense, um, if you believe that you understand what a smooth variety looks like, now in some sense you understand what a, what a complex variety looks like, namely one has a whole lot of, piece of smooth data, namely the strata, and then you have gluing data which is locally fiber fiber -based. Come with the uh, invasion into PN or something? Not necessarily, no. Because uh, how do you define second planes? Ah, so for the for the Whitney condition, we embed in some CN. It's a local question, mm -hmm. and it doesn't depend on anything. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay, so now um, basically, I started out by saying that we need to have some uh, idea of what varieties look like in order to understand perverse sheaves. And perverse sheaves kind of become extremely powerful when applied for maps. So for example, the decomposition theorem, which we'll get to at the end of this, these lectures, 
is an incredible statement about um, the kind of topology of, of, of maps between algebraic varieties. So we also have to have some idea of what maps look like between algebraic varieties. And so now I just want to give you some examples of maps. Open set U in Y, F, F is a tile. And so it's here. So after deleting. Uh, I always mean algebraic uh, regular. So uh, basically throughout, it's always complex varieties and always regular maps. So throughout. I mean, for example, what's the stratification on the curve? It's just a Zariski open subset and then the finite many points that <coughs> con consist of the com complement. And so we get it, we get a stratification in this case. And so this means it's determined, so over this set it's determined. So um, if you fix a point U, it's determined by the action of I1 of U on the phi one. Okay, so, and this will be transitive. So this is a very nice example to think about what, as kind of as a first example of an algebraic map because it's given by so Essentially, always this will be a free group, and it's acting so a free group with some transitive action on some finite set. So it's a sort of easy combinatorial data. And moreover, we can also say what happens at each of the ramification points. What is this term? I mean, once one knows this action, one can recover the whole situation. The <coughs> Yeah. So F is determined. We have restricted to U in this determined. No, I think what I mean what you know, if if you know it on if you know it on U, then you know some open piece up here, and this has a unique projective closure. Mm. Okay. 
And moreover, we can say reasonably precisely. So at, at each gratification point, Yep. Looks locally like the following. So here's one of our verification points. And then they'll so it'll map some some number of these this down and each Like a staircase. Again, when you say projective closure, do you mean take any projective closure and this will go arise or what? No, it's unique, no? Uh, what is this? It's the projective closure. Projective uh, closure can be simple, right? Yeah, but I mean, this, I mean this is a smooth thing. Yes, so you take any projective closure and this will go arise. You take I guess so, yeah. But I think one can, I think one could say this better. But I'm not at the moment. What? I think one can say this better, but I'm not. I'm not saying it better than I'm saying it. So each. So each of these pieces just looks like, um, you know, Z goes to Z to the end. So now um, I just want to give uh, some examples of birational. So another uh, <coughs> phenomenon that one doesn't see in the case of curves is kind of jump is non-flatness. Excuse me, and it's not it's not necessarily the same. No, no, no. Yeah, um, yeah, for varying n. first example. So basically, I'm going through these examples, and if you're familiar with them, fantastic, and if you're not familiar with them, and you want to continue following the course, just uh, think a little bit about them before next time. And it's also birational but regular. Birational but regular, yeah, exactly. <coughs> birational regular. Um, so an example would be the blowing up kind of archetypal example of a um, rational map. And so a real picture is again a staircase, but a different staircase. So this is E. Another example that will be, um, so this is the blowing up. And this is another example that will be extremely useful is, um, is rational surface singularity. This is another example of a birational map between surfaces. So a resolution of 
So here we have some S, a smooth surface. And inside it, we have E, some um, collection of. So it's a reducible curve. in our surface with um, all so possibly reducible and all components as a multi one. And then we have a map down with what's called the silver down to S such that F is an isomorphism. away from E and contract E to a point zero. Mm -hmm. So the real picture 